Sasquatch, Bigfoot, Grassman. In the South, they call it Skunk Ape, Wood Booger, or Rougarou. And across the globe, Yeti, Yowie, and Yaren, to name a few. More than 30 Native American tribes have a name for the beast. Some as endearing as Big Brother, or as ominous as Boss of the Mountain. They've been depicted on the walls of caves for centuries. To date, there are over 11,000 reported sightings of these creatures in North America alone. There is an abundance of physical, empirical, and anecdotal evidence supporting the existence of these seemingly human primates, yet it is still considered a myth. Our focus is not to research or try to prove Bigfoot exists but to document the findings and experiences of Bigfoot researchers and everyday people like ourselves. Joined by my wife and co-host Linda, we will travel the country interviewing, taking expedition, and visiting the locations where their Bigfoot odyssey began, bringing to you their means, observations, and interactions with the man-like beast known as Bigfoot. I'm Kerry Arnold, and this is Bigfoot Odyssey. On this episode of Bigfoot Odyssey, we're in East Texas with Sisters of the Moon. This group of ladies lay the course of Bigfoot research together. Though their individual experiences helped influence their interest in the subjects, their Bigfoot Odyssey is one of solidarity, with each member lending their own style and proficiency to the aggregate. An open mind, a skeptical eye, and a high standard for evidence put Sisters of the Moon ahead above in Bigfoot research. Hope y'all enjoy the show. When we got to the Texas Bigfoot Conference, we were supposed to meet the sisters there. We were a little bit early. They were just setting up. You may recognize a few faces. There's Lyle Blackburn, Cliff Barackman. Uh, as much as I didn't like finding Bigfoot, I have to respect Cliff and his contributions to the subject. Sisters of the Moon are truly dedicated to their research. They put in as much work out of the woods as they do in them. You know, these ladies are life professionals and they set up at conferences like this one to sell Bigfoot novelties and memorabilia so they can afford equipment to conduct their research. You know, some very generous people have stepped up and donated some of the equipment they use in the field. We commend anybody who makes those kind of sacrifices for a less reputable subject, but still is comprised of conscientious magnates like Sisters of the Moon. What about when you were little, before you were a teenager even? Any, uh, any idea that Sasquatch was real, that, that they existed, or any experience at all? Back then, we didn't know what Sasquatch was, Bigfoot. You know, Patty, of course, had been filmed, but I was a baby when that happened, and <laughs> we lived out in the country, and we got three channels. No internet, so, you know, things were a lot different back then, but I knew what the Falk Monster was, because I grew up about 40 miles from there, had right. family that lived there, played in the woods with my cousins there. So we all knew about the Falk Monster, but our parents told us, oh, that's just, that's not real. You know, and especially after the movie came out and it said based on true events, we were still told that's not real, honey. They just said that to make it more exciting and interesting. But it's still there, you know, in the back of your head, especially when you're a kid. Monsters were scary, but they were cool, too. I think the moment that we re I realized that, of course, I wasn't sure still what this was, but it was uh, Christmas, getting ready for Christmas, hanging Christmas lights. I was 14, and my mama was sick, so she was in the front room of our house in bed. Me and my daddy were on the front porch, and we had started on this end hanging blue Christmas lights, and I say blue because they're not as bright as your white Christmas lights and we didn't have the front porch light on because we wanted to see how it looked when we were hanging it. Didn't have the carport light on and our security light was in the back of our house. And like I said, we were in the country so there, there wasn't other lights around. And uh, we were hanging the lights and 
from our left, not right up on us, but further down, you know, off in the distance, we heard this. When I described it back then, when it happened, I was like, it was a roar, moan, growl, scream. Just, uh, you know, all at one time. And that, of course, doesn't do it justice at all. And my eyes, I know, got big as saucers. And I said, what was that, Daddy? And he just kind of looked and he goes, I don't know what that was. But why don't you go on in the house and get my gun? And I was like, no not without you, you come in. And I was starting to talk fast because I was wanting to get in the house fast. I said, you come in with me, come on. He goes, no, go get my gun. And I was like, daddy, please. And then we heard it again, but it was closer up to us. And same exact sound. And so I was really scared then. And I had already, I was starting to cry. I was like, please, daddy, come in. And he was like, go get my gun. And I said, daddy, please, I'm not going in without you. And then we heard it a third time, and this time it sounded like it was right there in our carport, which was just from there to there, you know, because we had a little front porch. And before I could say, Daddy, let's go, he was pushing me in the door, which really scared the crap out of me because he was a Vietnam vet, a Korean War vet, and a World War II vet. And I'd never seen my daddy scared at all. Yeah. And so I was petrified because I knew my daddy was worried. And I was bawling. I had already started bawling. And he pushes me in the front door, which basically was the little entrance way. And then I ended up in Mama's bedroom. And she's like, what's going on? When she saw me bawling and Daddy just went straight through the house and he went and got his gun. And I'm in there telling her, there's a monster outside. And I'm roaring, you know, roaring. And, roaring. <laughs> and she's, you know, she's sitting up in bed now. And here comes Daddy back out the front door with his gun. So I'm following, we had like a long shotgun style house, you know. I'm going from room to room in the house, looking out the windows, trying to follow and make sure this monster didn't get my daddy. And he went all the way around the house. And then he came back in the house. And he was like, there's, I don't see anything. You know, and all he had was his gun and a flashlight. And he said, uh, go call your Aunt Overly, which was my mama's sister. And she had lived there forever. I mean, forever. And we had only lived there probably by then about four years. And so he said, go in there and call your Aunt Ovely, tell her what you heard, and ask her if she has any clue what that could be. So I'm in there now on the phone, roaring, moaning, growling to my Aunt Ovely. <laughs> and uh, she's like, oh, hun, don't worry. That's probably Miss Clay Schulte's bulls across the street. You know, we lived down a dirt road, and there was a big open pasture, and this little old lady lived all by herself, and she had bulls, cows, chickens. Um, I want to say she had a goat, too, but I, <laughs> that might have been a neighbor on the other side. But um, anyway, so that kind of calmed us down a little bit. Well, Miss Clay Schulte just happened to be a lady that would come down every day and give my mama shots, you know, for pain and stuff to help manage that. And so the next day, she did. She came down, and I'd been in the back room, which was, you know, in the back of the house, and Daddy calls her, I mean, calls me, and he said, Debbie, come in here. And he said, Miss Clay Schulte, you know, you sure gave us a scare the uh, last night. And she was just, I could see her, she was just sitting there in the rocking chair. Well, what do you mean, Mr. Bald? <laughs> and she, he said, Debbie, do that, do that sound we heard. And so there I go again, you know. I, roaring and growling for Miss Clay Schulte and she's just a rocking and uh, he said but we you know we called Overly and she just eased us you know eased our nerves and said that it was probably one of your bulls over there and she goes oh Mr. Bob I wish you hadn't told me that and he was like no it's all right don't worry we'll know next time and she goes no no I don't have any of my bulls none of my animals are over there and she said they're all in decaf which was seven miles away I can't remember now if she said that they were up there being bred or, or what it was, but they were all up there for some reason. But she goes, as a matter of fact, something's been killing my chickens. And so that left me with the notion that we did have something really kind of scary in our woods. I always just kind of assumed that it was something to do with the fout monster. We were downriver 
you know, we lived not far from the Sulphur River. I was always right there with my daddy. I was his right hand man, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I remember one day and looking back now, especially doing what we do, you know, and looking for what we look for, I think that's pretty strange that this happened, but he had killed a possum. And he, it was real late at night, and I was always right there with him to help him. And he was going to, he usually I would bury it or whatever. I don't even remember how he got rid of it. But he had taken that possum and put it in our garbage can. And he put the lid on the garbage can and then put this big rock, which was probably about this big, on top of that garbage can because he didn't want any animals coming up there and messing with it during the night before he could get rid of it the next day. And so... Um, you know, I was there with him. He put that big rock up there. So the next morning, he comes out and we're gonna go get rid of this possum. So he moves that rock, takes the rock off, opens the lid up, and there's no possum in there. And we just never could figure out where that possum went. You know, unless there was some hillbillies out in the woods and they needed something for dinner, I don't know. But that possum was not there, but that lid was on it and that rock was on it and that garbage can, of course, was still standing up. So looking back on that, that makes me think, hmm, that's mighty interesting. Right. I was too worried about vampires and werewolves. I didn't know anything about no Bigfoots, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm always interested in scary stuff. That always just, it always give me an adrenaline rush, you know. Something comes scary on TV. A lot of times, Mama would make me go to bed, and I'd beg her, Mama, please let me watch it, and go, no, you're not watching it, Sandy. You're going to end up in the bed with me and your dad. And, um, but most of the time, she'd give in and let me watch it. But um, when I really started getting intrigued with it, like most people, I'm not going to say everybody, I can't speak for everyone, but the legend of Boggy Creek, I was probably, I don't know, 10, 11 years old when it came out. And, I remember um, seeing the movie and being petrified. I mean, that movie just, it just, it was horrible because it was supposed to be real. I knew a werewolf wasn't supposed to be real or a vampire wasn't be, supposed to be real. They still scared the hell out of me. But I still knew deep down they weren't supposed to exist, but I, I was cool with that. Um, but I also, and I've told this before on a, um, other interviews that, I remember seeing that it was in Arkansas where this happened and I remember going and looking at a United States map as a little girl and putting my finger on it and then putting it on Georgia. I went, oh, God, thank you, Jesus, I'm cool. There ain't no way this thing's going to come all the way across the country just to get this one little girl. So I was okay with it, but it still scared me. But what really sparked my interest was my son was a teenager still living at home and we lived in a little towny, remote town called Odom, Georgia. Nothing more than a caution light. I mean, that's how small the city was. And anywhere you had a home out there, there was wood somewhere around you. And he had, he had let my two puppies outside. As you can tell, I'm a dog lover. And we had dogs back then, too. And he had let them outside for me and was sitting out on the patio on a swing. And... I started to go out the door to join him, and when I did, he was about to break his neck trying to get back in the house. He was about 15, 16 years old, and my puppies that thought they were mighty dogs were about to break their necks trying to get in with him, and he said, Mama, don't go out there, don't go out there, and I said, what's wrong, son? He said, Mom, there's something behind the shop over there, and he said, it just let out this horrible roar. I said, are you sure? He said, no, Mom, go get up Scott. I said, Scott ain't going to get up. He says, Mom, I'm telling you, go get Scott up. So um, I go back there, and sure as the world, my husband ain't going to get up. He just rolls over and goes back to sleep. So I said, get on in here. It'll be okay. We settle down. He goes to bed. And a couple days later, I have the Internet. And I'm on the Internet playing around, and my son's walking by the little office area where I had the... the um, computer up and I said come in here a minute son let's see if we can figure out what you heard so I was pulling up different sounds like bobcats they can make a horrible sound um, cougars even though we have panthers in Georgia 
but the DNR say that there's not any there, but there is. <laughs> there really, there is. We, um, yeah, and um, we have fox. I mean, any kind of sound that I knew was in our South Georgia woods. I pulled it up and let him listen to it, and everything I pulled up, he was going, no, Mama, that's not what I heard. That's nothing near what I heard. Well, I was pulling up howls, and it come, brought up one that said Bigfoot howls. And I said, okay, let's pull this up clicked on it and as soon as I played it he went that was it and I looked at him I said are you kidding me no mom play it again I played it again he says that was it mom that's what I freaking heard I went do you know what you just heard he said no what was it I said you ain't gonna believe it when I tell you he said what did it say it was I said it said it was a Bigfoot howl he went are you kidding me I said no I'm not well that sparked the interest and that's when I contacted my sister who was living about 10 miles up the road from me at that time and so we we started getting really interested then and and then from then on out when I go outside I could I was paying stuff attention I think that's what so many people do when they're outside and um, they're just sitting around and they hear stuff they're not paying any attention to what they might be really really he hearing they're just brushing it off as something else I was young and you know of course, I've always been an outdoor person, loved to be outside. I had five cousins that were all boys that were older than me, and then I had my sisters were older than me, so I was always kind of a tomboy. <laughs> so I was always with them fishing, or they'd go hunting, or we'd go sit out trot lines, or whatever. I was always right there with them, and I enjoyed that. So we were in the woods all the time, and um, I just always loved it, you know. It was always just, it's where I, you know, I guess you say I found my peace. <laughs> but um, my cousin, my oldest boy cousin, who lives very close to Fout, not very far at all, um, he was parking uh, with his girlfriend in the cemetery. And he said he kept noticing something like, kind of like it was peeking behind the shed. There was a big shed there, or I guess they kept their, like, lawn equipment and stuff, you know. And he said he noticed something kept peeking around and he said they were talking and she was like, do you see that? And, you know, they just kept looking. And he was telling the family this story and, you know, and telling me and I was in junior high and he was in high school. And um, so he said, you know, I kept looking and I thought something's out there. There's somebody here looking at us. And so he turned his lights on, I think he said in his car, you know, and he said it stood up. And when it stood up, he said it was like a head taller than the shed. And he was like, oh my God. He said, I knew exactly what it was. Well, it terrified him, terrified him. He lived in the woods, hunting, fishing. You know, he was just, grew up, you know, country boy in the woods from Arkansas. And he wouldn't go back in the woods. He just would not go. I mean, he literally, he was just terrified. And so that really set with me, you know, and I was just like, wow, you know, because I believed everything he said, you know, everybody else was kind of giving him a hard time and laughing and whatever, but I was like, and to this day, he's like, I can't believe that you go in the woods like that. He said, I don't do that. I never, he said, I quit doing that. He said, that terrified me because he said, you know, when it stood up and it was taller than the shed, he said, and he had his lights on and he said, I knew exactly what it was. So that really, I would say, is what got me interested in it. It made me go, I was just, I wasn't obsessed with it, but I just wanted to know more. You know, I wanted to go, I wanted to see. And of course, I didn't know anybody who did anything or knew anything about that other than what the movie was about, you know, and I read what I could about that. And so as I got older, I just was always interested and I would always just read anything, look up anything I could on the internet, anything about it, it just intrigued me. And so I always just did. And of course, you know, when you do this, people give you a really hard time. <laughs> and you know, you gotta be kind of thick skinned and I don't care, you know, it doesn't bother me because people are like, you know, you're an intelligent person. What in the world makes you think that that is out there? And I'm like, what makes you think it's not? I said, how do you know? They, it is a proven fact that they find a, at least 20 new species of animals a year. I mean, you know, I watch so much Animal Planet, National Geographic, Explore, all that. 
and they do they find an average of 20 new species a year and I'm thinking why are people is it so hard for people to think there's something out there we don't know say I was a teenager in 1969 so when I heard about Patty I was really interested in that but I wasn't worried about it because that was out west up in the north on the Pacific Northwest and I wasn't worried about it coming to see me or bother me so I was real interested in it but I didn't hear a whole lot about it at that time and then I got old enough to date went to the drive-in to see the legend of Boggy Creek and just scared me to death and then it was on my mind a lot more because that was Arkansas well I, I, I would watch anything I could find on TV. If it came on TV and I spotted it, I'd sit down and watch it because I was interested in it. But I really didn't have anything happen to me until 2001 when I was in Georgia and my sister and I were living in the same town and she called me telling me about how she was hearing stuff behind her house. So that's when we started trying to look up stuff on the internet and find out about howls and listening to howls and kind of reading the encounters that people were having. And then I left Georgia and went back to Texas in 2005 and bought my home in Lamar County. And it's in a rural neighborhood, but the people aren't close together. And my neighbor to the south came up and visited me and was telling me how it was a nice place to live and everything and didn't have anything to be scared of. People didn't bother you. I said, well, I'm not worried about the people. I said, I don't want Bigfoot to come up. He said, well, you might see one. So that put the thought in my mind that they could be in that area where I was at. And then nothing really happened too much because I moved there in April. And that's kind of the end of the season when things happen around my house. It would be from like October to April and then summertime things happen, but not as often. But in October, on Halloween night, I had a big, huge, I call it a Mexican fireplace. Some people call it a chimney, but you put on your patio. And I got up November 1st and went out there and this huge fireplace has just been pushed over and broken into a million pieces. And I just thought it was so odd because, again, when nobody comes up to my house, there was no wind. It was a nice, calm night, no storms or anything, and it would take an awful lot of wind to push this thing over anyway. And then I started, I had horses that I'd bring up to the barn to feed, and when I'd go out to the barn, I started finding little, small, six-inch footprints, just the most perfect little footprints that looked like a small child but there were no small children. There was no small children at my house. None of my neighbors had any small children. So I'd get excited about that, and I'd call my sister and tell her how I thought things were going on. And, and we just started having a whole lot of stuff happening. And we have two gates on our north side of our house. They're two 10-foot gates, and one hangs off at each pole, but we chain them together in the middle. Well, one morning I woke up and my horses were in my front yard. And I just, how the heck did that happen? So I went around and looked and that gate had been put up off of one post and pulled back 20 feet and laid on the ground by the other post. They just picked it up off the post and laid it down. I had a house around my house. I, what kind of house? Just. Oh, the kind you'd hear on TV, like a ooh. But then I also hear like a cooing. Like something just be outside my window, just ooh, just cooing at me. Well, I, I, finally so much stuff started happening that I contacted a large organization and they sent someone out to talk to me and I told them about what was happening and she confirmed what I thought was going on, that there was big activity here. Um, I had an experience when I was hunting with uh, three men folk of my family. I walked up on something one time, 
it was we were squirrel hunting and we were coming back to the truck and we had to walk through this bog so it had a little it had a bog on one side and a little pond on the other and my grandfather said let's see if any ducks light so we immediately walked around there and I think I went to the farthest end of the pond and got up under some brush and I wasn't there very long when I heard a, a step and then another step and another step and I immediately thought giant reptilian or something I wasn't turning around I was very I had a 410 shotgun on my lap and I knew that was useless the thought came into my mind to don't move and you'll be okay so I went with it because there was nothing else that I had planned and then um, the steps weren't freaky enough and then I have this voice in my head and that was freaking me out and then my ears started ringing real loud it got louder and louder and louder until I was just incapacitated and then they just let up and I heard one of the guys moving around and we got to the truck and I asked did anybody walk behind me and they said no and that's what started me on this for years I couldn't figure out what it was I grew up down in those woods and um, I couldn't it was like a triangle trying to stick it in a round hole you know because cows were down there until I got to college and I met a girl that was worked at the nature center at Beaver's Bend during the summer and I told her the story. Usually everybody would say, ooh, scary, I wonder what it was. But she said, I th sounds like a Bigfoot to me. And I said, what? And that was my first clue, and, and it worked. What walked behind me, I still don't know, but, you know, Bigfoot works. January of 2017, the, all of us had planned to have an expedition, so to speak, it was an outing in southeast Oklahoma to a place we'd never been before. Um, we, there were three of us when we first got there. It was me and Patty and Carrie. And we were looking for a place to camp. We don't like staying in campsites. And there was some primitive camping areas there, but we wanted to stay in the woods. You know, we didn't want to be near anybody, which there wasn't anybody out there anyway, because it was the end of January. And the low that night, I know, was 16 degrees. And so we were in Carrie's truck, and I was in the back seat, and we were looking for a good place to camp. And we had pulled in this one area and was backing up, and you know, to head out to a different little spot. And I'm looking over my shoulder to make sure that she didn't back into anything. And I saw ribcage, you know, the bones coming up. And I said, hold on a second. I said, there's, there's a ribcage back there. I said, it actually looks like more than just a ribcage. But what caught my attention even more was there was more than one. There, I believe I saw three at first. And then I said, y'all, let's get out and look at this for a second. And Patty gets out, and I get out, and then Carrie follows, and we go up there. And I believe there was probably five or six just in that front general area. And our first instinct, thoughts, was that it was poachers. But when we looked over, you know, just glancing around, there was some, another one. And then we could see more bones and more. And so we walked around, we went back behind this huge bush. I remember there was a tree down over a trail. And so we had to walk around that way and we could see bones on the other side of that tree. And so we just started following this trail. And the more it went back, the more bones we kept seeing. Here's some images of some of the bones they found. And I believe she said they found 29. And I mean, that's just the ones that they found. Uh, the interesting thing to me is it, it's not poachers. Poachers are not going to leave that much carcass behind. They might leave behind some hide, maybe, you know, legs, hooves, something like that. But look at this. That is a femur that's broken, and it's not a snap break. It looks like a twist break. Now, that's definitely not something a hunter is going to do. And they were, some would be scattered. Some were intact where it was the spinal uh, column, the hip bones, neck, you know, heads still attached. And when we got back way off the road, it opened up and it was, it was he more heavily wooded than this, but tons of pine trees. And um, it opened up to probably three acres that we could see and there were bones everywhere. I mean, you couldn't walk from me to you, which is maybe, you know, five foot at the most 
without there being a bone. So we were out that day and um, just kind of going up and down some of the roads and that's when um, Debbie says, look, look, I see some bones or something kind of over here. And we said, okay, so I jump out and we're looking and this is all, you know, just a, a road and there's just woods everywhere. And we start looking and we, as we go farther into it, we just see there's a pile of bones here and we go a little way, there's more bones. And we go around this corner where this huge tree was down and it opens up into this, like a, you know, I guess a peninsula or whatever, but there's water all the way around it, but it's like a big, huge hill, and it's probably two or three acres, I would guess, you know, and we just all start walking, and, and of course, there's leaves everywhere, but we counted 29 deer of all different, I would say, um, degrees of, of, you know, where they had started, you know, um, like they'd, some you could tell had been there, they were just clean bones. Some still had a little bit of hair on them, you know. Some still had a little gristle and, and some of the connective tissue. And so they were in different stages, but they were all over an area just like, it was a hill like this. And it was just, they were everywhere, everywhere you looked. And we were like, and we kept thinking, you know, maybe it is poachers, maybe poachers are cleaning deer. But I, I knew, because I was married to a hunter and I thought, they don't leave all this. They would never leave all this because, you know, all this has got the meat on it. And I said, that's what they want. And I said, they wouldn't just kill the deer and leave them all laying here. So we just kept looking and looking, and then we'd see some of them. You know, we'd pick them up, and their neck was broken, but they were attached, but the neck was broken, or the back femur was broken. We noticed all along there, even though there was tons of leaves, because it was a pretty heavy wooded area, there were these, what I call foxholes, I don't know any other word to say, is that they were like foxholes. And they were like, you know, places that you could kind of like get down in. And it's like if you were down in them and you were laying down, you'd never see them if you were walking. And we saw several of those. And it just all was so odd to us. And we thought, this is really weird. You know, this is just, it's just very unusual. So Back up on that ridge line, towards more towards the center of the peninsula you could see that every so often there would be these holes not really a hole but I don't even know how to describe it but it it was deep down to, and it was longer than we were if we were to lay in it you know flat which we did it was longer and so if something was on the ground you know or walking you wouldn't see whatever was laying in that hole or Call it out area but uh, there were eight of those and we just noted how it was really interesting that where they were located and this is just a theory but the deer could be coming up you know to that ridge line and then something coming up out of those holes and you know bombarding them <laughs> surprising them but that was interesting and uh, walking around you know on up from that there was these two little sapling type trees they were bigger than saplings but not much and they had been crossed over and bent over and they were crossed once one was a cedar i remember that the other one i don't recall and it was january so there wasn't a whole lot of leaves on the trees cedar still had of course uh, some but there were two snaps on each of trees and it was interesting because they weren't broken completely through they were just snapped both both sets and I I commented a lot on that but uh Henry had said you know this this would make a good blind she said I'm not saying it's a blind but it'd be a good one we left there we went into camp we you know found a place set up camp and it was probably about five minutes you know from there if you got in the vehicle and drove around now if you walk straight on across it'd probably be about a 10 minute walk to where we were camping that night and so we had two tents me and patty were in one tent and carrie was set up we were kind of like l shape you know like this so carrie was set up to our side and uh had our fire out in front of us patty's got these huge chimes that hang down have the big tubes on them we had hung them on the side of a pine tree on the other side of the fire. And then further on out, there was the wood line. And we always like hanging glow sticks, or we'd make them into the glow necklaces. 
we like hanging those out far off where we can't see you know because it's so dark but we put them up way high and that way if something walks in front of them it's going to black it out and we know that something tall because i'm the tallest one and i'm always i have a stool and i'll get up on the stool and i'll hang them on the you know what i can reach and we put them on tiny branches so raccoons can't crawl out there and mess with them and stuff but so we had hung out 14 of those glow necklaces that night patty's cooler was in front right of my tent and i was dead to the world that night i went to sleep patty she hears everything it was very very cold we had set all that stuff up and we sat by the fire and i think we probably went to bed about one o'clock something like that and it was freezing and I was zipped up in this my friend's one-piece hunting suit they let me borrow and I mean you know I was like okay you know this is a little colder than I thought because it really wasn't supposed to get to about 30 28 or 30 so um, we go to bed and I have my one little sleeping bag <laughs> that I thought was gonna keep me nice and warm <laughs> well I get in that sleeping bag and zip myself up and Debbie's over here and Debbie's probably under 10 blankets and we have our little Mr. Buddy and you know we all get ready for the night and we decide to go to bed so we still have a nice big fire we always kept a big fire and our our chairs were like this kind of around the fire you know so and right in front of our tent Debbie had a like a I guess you call it fake grass like turf to keep the dirt from getting in your tent so that was right in front of us and then I had set my ice chest right here at the front of the tent, but we had locked up all the food in the car because of bears. We knew not, you know, because of bears. So um, I just had drinks in there. That's all I had. So I had that sitting by the, the um, front of the, the tent. So we go to bed. Well, I wake up and I am frozen because the Mr. Buddy, you know, which makes that sound, had gone off. And I thought, Oh my God, and I literally couldn't feel my feet. I couldn't feel my hands. My face was so cold and I was sitting there just contemplating. I thought, okay, I thought these Mr. Buddy things lasted longer and I thought, we got about two hours out of that. And I thought, okay, I had brought more, but they're in Debbie's car. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna have to wake her up. I'm gonna wake everybody up. So I was sitting there thinking, okay, I guess I'm going to have to do it. And then I hear something in the trash. And I thought, oh, there's raccoons out there. You know, because you could tell something was kind of just kind of going through the trash, moving stuff around. And um, I listened for a minute and I thought, I bet that's raccoons. Well, then I hear a deafening. If you've ever taken a Coke can and you squeeze it and it goes, uh, 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 that kind of metal tin sound, I thought, hmm. I don't know if raccoons would be able to squeeze a Coke can and make that noise. So I just listened and I was just basically sitting there being really, really quiet because I didn't want to move and make noise. I just wanted to listen. And there was no wind whatsoever because the chimes were not ringing. They were dead still. And it was very, very quiet. And so I just listened, you know, for a little bit and I hear something walking. And I mean, it sounded definitely like something on two feet walking and it actually bumped one of the chairs and I heard the chair kind of scoot a little bit and I thought okay this is not a raccoon so I could see the fire and I could see a shadow a big shadow but I couldn't tell what it was you know because it was dark everywhere else and it was just the fire so I'm sitting there listening and I hear it go by a chair and I hear it kind of scoot the chair just a little bit and I thought hmm so then I hear it walk, and it walks right up to that turf. And the turf, you know, is that grass, plastic grass, and it makes a little, you can hear it on the turf. And I'm laying there thinking, oh my God, oh my God, whatever it is, it's coming to the tent. And I'm thinking, it's right here in front of me. <laughs> and I remembered the ice chest was there. And I thought, oh my God, it thinks there's food in that ice chest. That whatever it is, whether it be a bear or whatever it is, but it was a tall, it was a big figure, but I could not make out what it was because it was so dark. I could just see the shadow of the fire behind it. And I'm over here trying like this, very quietly, to get Debbie, and I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I'm not, and I cannot reach her. I'm like a hand too, and I'm like, oh. 
So I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God. And I'm thinking, you are out here for this. Why are you so terrified? Well, it was my first time. And, and you know, I thought to myself, okay, I just got to be quiet and listen. Well, it walks up right over that ice chest and it just stands there. And the only thing I can say is that the four deep breaths that I heard, the only thing I could compare it to is we used to have horses and we kept them at this big ranch and they had buffalo. And when you would get up next to those buffalo, they had that deep kind of a guttural, you know, almost a wet sound breath that just like that. And I heard that very slow four times as it stood right there. And I'm sitting there thinking, whatever it is, if it's coming to eat me, I can't feel my feet. I can't feel my, I'm just, all I am is a head sticking out of a little papoose. <laughs> and I thought if I move to look at, see what it is, it's going to be, it's going to hear that, know that I'm not asleep, you know. And Debbie was asleep. Everybody else was asleep. I could hear them breathe. Everybody was asleep. I was the only one awake. And I'm laying there thinking, oh my God, I can't reach her. And it's right here. And I could hear it breathe, that deep, guttural breath. And I thought, oh, that is something big. It's not a squirrel. It's not a, a raccoon. It's not. A, it's, it's something huge. And it just stood there. It didn't. It didn't open the chest, the uh, ice chest, which I thought maybe it would, but it just stood right over it. And I think it was thinking there was food in there, but it didn't want to make noise. So then it walks back and walks back to the trash can again. And I hear it go back in the trash can again. And I hear it hitting those Coke cans like, eh, eh, eh. and I thought, that is so weird. So I just lay, lay there because literally my heart was pounding I could feel my heart beating in my hands it was pounding so hard because it's like okay this is what you're out here for but yet the adrenaline rush you're terrified but you're excited at the same time you, you know I don't know how else to explain it but you're just so excited and I was laying there thinking okay you're just you just listen and see what it does well I laid there probably another good hour until I never heard another sound I wanted to be very sure <laughs> that I could get up. Well, I didn't hear anything, so all of a sudden I'm fixing to get up. I'm gonna go wake everybody up, and I hear two over the lake, because there's a lake right down, the, you know, the bottom of that big hill or whatever cliff we were on, you know, it was down, the lake was down that way. I hear two long, long, melancholy howls over the lake, and they were like, Almost, I mean, they were so melancholy and sad sounding, and they were long howls. And I thought, it's almost like it was saying, you need to come home. <laughs> and so I thought, oh my God, those are, they're not, it wasn't, we know coyotes, you know, we know all, but this was a definite, it sounded female to me is all I can say. So I jumped up and I said, get up, Debbie. I started pounding on her get up, get up, get up. And I was just like, you will not believe what always happened. So then we wake everybody up. But the next night is what was really interesting. Um, we had all gone to bed again, and this time we had rigged up a little piece of jute between our tent and Carrie's in case we needed to wake each other up if something like that happened again. And um, I was awake that time because from what she had told us that she had experienced and heard and I was like, there's no way I'm going to go sleep tonight. <laughs> and so I was bound and determined to stay awake. And I did. And um, that night, Carrie had also pulled her truck at an angle back behind our tents. And she had those big chrome bumper on the front and nice wheels. So the fire in front of us was reflecting through, you know, the little crack where our tents were set up. It was reflecting through there onto her bumper which was reflecting that fire back on the back side of our tents, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so later on that night, um, Henry was also there. Henry had come in and she was sleeping in her vehicle to the right of my tent. I had I started hearing stuff and I wanted to make sure it wasn't Carrie. And so I hollered, not hollered, but I, I said, Carrie. And she, scared her and she was up and she was like 
And I said, is that you? She said, yeah, but something's here. And I said, okay. And I don't know why I answered okay, but I did. And so we're, we're listening and we're seeing shadows on the back sides of our tents. And so I sit up on the side of my you know, bed and I'm watching and Patty's awake, of course, and I'm sitting there using hand signals pointing to the back of the tent to let her know there's something over here. But at the same time, we started hearing stuff on this side of our tent, more to the front. And so I'm also pointing this way. And it was just so much, so much movement. I thought, I'm gonna try to look out. And that was a huge step for me because that's my biggest fear is looking out and seeing something looking back at me. And so I slowly got up hoping my knees weren't going to pop as I was standing up so they wouldn't hear that. All the time in my head praying, you know, saying, Debbie, you can do this. Look out. It's going to be okay. Just look out. You can do this. So I looked out of the tent and I looked to the right and Henry's vehicle was over there. I looked to the left. I could see the right hand side of Carrie's tent. The flap coming down, wasn't an ounce of wind. Fire was still going, but it was low, and that was directly in front of me. And I could see the tree, the pine tree that the chimes were hanging on, because there was enough fire to see that. And of course that was reflecting in the chimes, but I couldn't see anything past that pine tree. It was just pitch black. Uh, I didn't even notice the glow necklaces, really. Down below those chimes, we had a wooden pallet leaning against the tree for firewood if we needed it, but we also had a whole row of firewood to the left of that. Anyway, I just, I, I looked up and all of a sudden those chimes, you know, they were hanging perfectly still, straight down. But it looked as though something all of a sudden just whacked them, hit them, and they came straight up. And I, what was so weird is when they came straight up, normally when something's hit with that force, they'll swing back mm -hmm. like this until they slow down and come to a stop or whatever. But when they swung up, for one thing, the tubes stayed perfectly horizontal with the ball and everything that's in the center. And they swung up, they didn't fall down around the sides like they normally would. They didn't swing backwards with force like they normally would they hit something that stopped them and you could hear that thud but then they went right back up again right back down you could hear that thud right back up down they did it five times and not once did those tubes fall down around them they all stayed perfectly horizontal with them like something was holding them and just moving them up there wasn't anything holding them that i could see did they ring out or was it like muted? No, it, it made noise. You could hear it. It would go, drunk, dun, drunk, dun. and it did it five times. You could hear that thud five times. It stopped for like a second or two, and then it started up again. It did three sets of five swings. And I'm standing there because I can't figure out what I'm seeing the way it was happening. Patty could see my eyes, and I look at her, and I'm doing you know my fingers like this t trying to tell her this was weird and mm -hmm. everybody could hear it Carrie could hear it of course you know we didn't know for sure but that she was awake at this time but uh, we found out the next morning too that Henry was in her Jeep and had those headphones on and she was like what the heck just the way that it sounded and the way I was seeing it it was it was so weird because I couldn't explain how those chimes were staying all together when they were horizontal in the air. And I couldn't explain what was stopping it back behind it. And so that next morning, we all come out and the first thing we do is go to these chimes. I'm over there trying to recreate it. I'm trying every possible way to recreate what I saw and the way it was stopping. And I couldn't do it. I know Henry came out of her vehicle and she was like, what was up with those chimes last night? It was just so weird. So that was the, the first night of my real experience. And I can't say that it was, it was a Sasquatch, but I can say that whatever it was, it walked on two feet and it definitely had that deep guttural growl. But one thing that we thought was so funny was we had, I had brought chili and 
we had chili for supper and we'd thrown all the bowls in the trash so when we looked at the trash the trash was not torn apart like you know bears usually will destroy everything the trash was in this big barrel and it was completely together but all the chili bowls had been licked clean and there was a pile of beans kind of back ways right where we'd hung the chimes there was a pile of beans about this big off all, all the beans from the chili had been spit out <laughs> and we thought hmm, I guess if it is him he doesn't like beans in his chili <laughs> But uh, we found out the next morning, too, that Henry was in her Jeep and had those headphones on, and she was like, what the heck? We also discovered a footprint out closer to the edge of the woods where the glow necklaces had been. So they cast the footprint. And then we went to get the glow necklaces, which we had 14 that had been put out the night before, but we could only find nine. Four, uh, five of them were missing. We looked all over, couldn't find them anywhere. When we went back three weeks after that, those bones were almost all gone. So we went over to the blind, and, or what we're calling the blind, stepped up there, and now remember, there were no bones anywhere. I mean, just very few, but around that blind, there weren't any bones. and. When we stepped up there, it, it's up a hill, there were some bones laid right there by that blind. And I, that shocked me, and I looked at Carrie and I said, come here. Because we had taken pictures. We had pictures showing that there were no bones there. And here it was two hours later with DW, and all of a sudden there's, there's bones laying there. I did listen, I had put a uh, recorder on that blind actually. And the next day, when we went back to get re the recorder, was the day we were leaving. When we walked out to get the recorder, it was just Carrie and I. Now, when DW was there and I was showing him the blind, we were talking about the blind, I pointed out how, I said, notice how it just has two snaps on each tree. They're not broken in two. I thought that was really interesting, you know. They were almost identical as far as the snaps and all four not being broken. So the next day, when we go to get that recorder, all four of those snaps were now broken in two. It's a really interesting area. We've been back several times, um, had a few other things happen out there, lots of vocals, uh, found feathers on top of one hill that led basically made it look like it was a perfect row. The feathers, the down of the feathers had been wrapped around the branches, which I know that when they're sitting on branches, that can happen sometimes. But what was really interesting about this to make us think it was more than that, is that they were in a perfect row that led to what looked like a trail. But who knows? We were camped in a in a park that had a lot of hiking trails. There, you know, there's uh, elderly people that come and exercise. There's kids I think that run from high school and people come and eat lunch. It's real busy. It's there's a lot of people in there. We were we were camped right by a creek and there were three or four other campsites taken and I was the second to the last and then the last one. Um, this guy had, was in a wheelchair. And he was down there talking to me, but we'd kept his fire going all night. When all of a sudden, we hear this animal in distress call right on the creek. It was three different sounds. It was a quack and a bark. I can't remember what the first one was, but they were all one. It was all one call. So I went over there and was looking. Of course, it, here we are Bigfoot, and it, it's a diversion, and we fall for it. Or I did. And when I was over there looking, I saw the shadows of his fire. And I turned and looked, and there was two, uh, I'll just tell you what they appeared to me. Mama, big sister, and there was a little brother, and then big daddy came in. I guess he did the call. And, and Jim said, 
Y'all put that stuff back, and that big one just turned and looked at Jim, and then just turned his back on him, and that was a whole new feeling for me. I had never seen, I had seen, I think I had seen that chocolate covered one before, but they, they squatted down, it was like Big Daddy, Mama, Big Sister with their backs to us, and the fire was on the other side, so I had these pristine uh, silhouettes to look at, and the little one would come, and he would sit like at the head of the table, and I had a profile of him, he, I think he'd been coming around the night before too, because he'd kind of see something flash by, they were, I think they were sending him in, and then he was getting them to come in whenever he found something. The little one would be there and just be perfectly still while the others looked or ate or whatever, and then he'd be gone again. They did not care that we saw them a bit. So I had this bright idea I was going to you hear all this why the game cameras don't catch and any pictures and the IR light, and I, I announced that I was going to do my little research right there to Jim with the, my extra IR light on my night vision and I turned that I flipped that switch on and I was watching I hit Big Daddy right in the middle of the back with it and I saw him squatted and then I saw him coming to an abrupt stop from a turn and the hair on his arms was sticking straight out and he was locked in on me and I thought to myself I wish I knew Jim a little better before I got him killed <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but I was, uh, that pretty much did it for the IR light for me, so I handed it to Jim. He was in the wheelchair, so <laughs> it wasn't, that wasn't the reason, but he said there's one on the trail on all, on 4x4, four four, you know, and we turned it off, and then they went back to pilfering his stuff. Then they went across the street to the woman and the two kids and the dog that had barked all day long and were pilfering hers. Um, and Jim said, let's go up there, I need to check my electronics. And we got up there and his air mattress is pulled out a little bit. But he said everything was put back in his his little plastic containers with the lids. And he said, all my Pop-Tarts are gone. Oh. <laughs> and uh, when we had walked up there just then, I think it was Mama, she was right in the tree line. And, and we got closer, she stepped back into the trees like she didn't want to catch what we had or... I'm not saying that's what it was, it, just so you can understand kind of how she did that. But Big Daddy was over there, and I could see some more, eye, another eye shine, so they were pilfering across the street. So I heard, a, then I heard a zipper back down at mine, and I didn't want man or beast going through my stuff, so let's, <laughs> let's go back down there. So we went back down there, and there was some chairs turned over and stuff, and they came back to Jim's, and they got on the ground, and they were crawling, and I was watching them watch me watch them crawl up there I could see five eye shines so I knew that there was three of them there and uh, they got so close and then they just stopped inside I think they were just trying to wait to see if they could scare us off or we went to bed but they crawled up there through the briars and stuff and uh, I watched them for a while and then I heard one wood knock on down the creek and they I saw them backing out and I saw them hit the water or heard them hit the water and then the dogs start barking on down one down the creek, so I don't know if that one would not meant come here, or it definitely meant leave there. That was that was my sightings of a lifetime so far. Well, I was on the internet looking up for groups in Northeast Texas that I could talk to and you know look, try to learn something what I might could do to to. Uh, learn about these creatures but I was also a little f afraid of doing too much because I do have neighbors and I didn't want a whole lot going on at my house that would cause harm to anybody which sometimes it can be kind of scary knowing that you're laying in your bed and you're in your home I'm not in the woods I'm at home in my own bed and there's Bigfoot pounding around out in the yard so I, I thought I'd meet up with these groups and that's where I met Henry and Debbie and of course you, Sandy is my baby sister so we had been interested in it together for a long long time and 
we met up at the lake. Actually, we went up there on an expedition, but we ended up filming like a sizzle reel. So our official first name was, I was in a Bigfoot movie that flopped. <laughs> and then Henry, being a, a huge Stevie Nicks fan, threw Sisters of the Moon out there, and we liked it. So we just started calling ourselves Sisters of the Moon, and we started out that January when we got together, but we really didn't form our group until after that first time in January. And Sandy came out in April, and she and I and Henry went camping. And then that summer, Henry and I and a friend of ours went camping over at Val. And we really didn't have an expedition planned until the next January in 17. But I ended up missing that one and didn't get to go for two weeks later. And then we just clicked so good. We just feel the same about so many things and that we like to be in together. We felt comfortable together in the woods and that's just the way we liked it. We just liked those girls being out there. We felt like that was drawing attention to us, only being females, that we'd possibly have a little bit more action than a bunch of guys out there. Do we just go out, act like a bunch of silly girls in the woods? And we have some crazy stuff happen to us. With guns. Girls with guns. Girls with guns. But we don't flash them. I try to keep mine covered up. I just don't want people or any a creature or a person see me walk around. I mean, I'm not ashamed of my gun. Don't get me wrong. I'm a gun lover, okay? But uh, I don't flash it being in the woods because I don't want something to be, feel threatened by me. Sandy and I came to the Bigfoot Conference last year in 2018, and we camped at a spot that Debbie had picked out. She had went down there and said, this looks like a good location. Why don't y'all camp down there? So Sandy and myself and our niece came with her, and we went down there and set up and went to the conference. And we got back, this is on Friday night, we got back probably around 11, 11.30, and we built a fire and it's raining. It had been raining all day long. It's just miserable weather to be sitting out, but we were happy. We were big footing. So my niece is sitting there and I said, hey, I've got this big talk on my phone. You want to hear big foot talk? She said, yeah, let me hear it. So I sat down and I played this gibberish. And just as soon as I quit playing it, I played it again. And the very instant I stopped playing this gibberish, from behind us in the woods, we hear, boom, boom, boom. And we start feeling energy. I, that's the only way I know how to describe it. Just like an energy coming up behind us, hearing it and feeling it coming up behind us. It gets to the tent, something goes to each side of the tent, shakes the trees on it and just pours the water all over us and leaves. Well, Sandy and I are sitting there talking and go, that gibberish, they understood it. Because we think it's saying, get out of here. Stop what you're doing and get out of here. So you think whatever it was, wasn't necessarily happy with? No, I didn't think it. I think they were really kind of teed off. They had got told to leave because they made a lot of noise leaving, but we never could see them because the woods are so thick there. But we could hear them. And you could see movement off into the sides, but you couldn't see any creatures. She started telling me all the activities she had going on at her home in Paris, Texas area. And um, went up there and paid her some visits. And one night we was out there, one of the visits, on her patio and she loved to go out there and sing karaoke. She did it for entertainment for him or something, I guess. But we was out there singing the songs that she said she would get out there and play for him um, from time to time. And then we quit doing all that. And she said, you know, Sandy, I'm never brave enough to go out here and do a, a wood knock like they do on that show, you know. She says, come out here at the end of the yard with me and let's do a wood knock. And she did a wood knock. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and 
really I didn't know what to expect. I really wasn't making fun of her, but I wasn't expecting at all what actually happened. Well, from a distance, a safe distance, I felt immediately, boom, 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 something right back. I went, Barbara, crap, did you hear that mess? And um, she said, yeah, yeah. And she said, I'm gonna do it again. And she did it again, boom, boom, boom. And I said, okay. Well, this time it, it felt like it wasn't far past her yard. I don't know if there was others out there. I didn't know. We were still in the learning stages, you know. Still am. I'll always be in the learning stages. But anyways, it felt like it was right there. And I said, you know what, sis? I think it's really time to go inside now. And then I thought, well, no. That's got to be my husband and her husband out there playing a joke on us because they know we're out there doing junk, you know. Neither one of them was a believer. But I could look through her window and there they sat on the couch. That's whenever I knew for real that, not that I didn't believe my sister, but it was positive proof to me that she really truly has some stuff going on around there. This is when you were fully convinced. Fully convinced. Henry and I had been camping with some friends, and the day we were leaving there, we decided to ride around some of the area. And we came upon this place that was along a creek. We saw that there was a dead deer down in that creek. Um, but what caught our attention is on the other side of the creek, there were tree breaks. And it was a straight row of tree breaks, and they were all pointing in the same direction. So, as Henry put it, it was really busy back in there. There was a lot of stuff going on that caught our attention. And so we decided to go check it out. And we went across uh, the creek to the other side. We followed that row back as far, and they weren't just boom, 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 but you could see one tree break, and then on down there you could see another tree break, and so on. So we followed all of the tree breaks, and we came up to an area where it was awesome. <laughs> I was standing in the center of a giant circle of tree breaks. I took my video, my phone rather, and videoed, went around and just filmed the entire circle. And the tree breaks were almost all the same height. Some would, you know, be like this. But for the most part, they were right there. And um, those in that circle, they were pretty high up. I mean, I would say a good nine foot high. Since the tree breaks were all pointing in the same direction, and at this spot, we didn't see any more in the line that we had been following, we decided to go off in the direction that those breaks were pointing in. And so when we got over into this area, there, were, there was this asterisk. It was, it was a beautiful asterisk. It was actually between two trees. There was a, what looked to be another tree that had been there, but it was just a sapling, but it was broken off probably three, four feet high. You could tell that it had purposely been made. And so we kept going back through there. There were arches that were woven. You know, something had, had to have hands to manipulate this. There were some that had like three arches and they would be woven around each other when they went back down and pinned down. Um, there was, I remember there was this one huge pine tree and back behind it was a, a smaller tree, the, about this big in diameter. And it was on the back side of that pine tree, but it had been pulled around and made this huge, huge arch, pulled around to the front of the pine tree. And then over here, there was another pine tree. So they took this smaller tree and pulled it back behind that pine tree. And then that same little smaller tree made a, a Y shape. They had taken the left hand side of the Y and he crossed it over the other and went around the front of another tree and then took the front hand part and pulled it back behind the tree, 
wrapped it around, crisscrossed, and then did the same thing on the following tree. That was manipulated, obviously, and so it was just awesome. Lots of stuff like that uh, where you could see manipulation. Was it was it a pretty remote area that oh, a lot of people went through there? It was remote. Um, it was a huge area. We were out there walking for probably four hours, maybe even five hours. Um, we never saw anybody. When we ride around out there, because we go back often to that whole area because of what ended up happening uh, when we decided to go camp back out there. So we go often and in this area where all the structures and stuff were, we've never seen anybody out there in that in that area. And um, there were there was another one where it was a big X and in the top part of the X there's an arch that goes through it and had been made and I've got a picture of Henry just looking at it like what was even more interesting though is in that same area and we kept following the more we'd walk the more things we'd see but there were these two huge trees um, they looked kind of like they like they had been some of the bark had been pulled off of them I don't know if they were cypress or what no leaves you know but they were so long, I would say a good 40, 50 feet long. And they had been uprooted. We looked all around that area. We couldn't find any holes that those trees had come out of. And the, the roots on them were huge and hard. Um, they were on their sides and the roots were stuffed in the ground, you know. And the top hand one was real sharp and it was like that long. I really thought this was impressive. You can see where that stuck down in the ground and they didn't fall there. They were dragged in there and put up in the wire of that tree. Now, how heavy is that? Is that the Boy Scouts or hunters? Yeah, I don't think so. We decided to go back out there and we were gonna stay for four days, three nights. And so Carrie and I were able, we, we were able to get off earlier. And so we met out there we had to follow a pin. Henry dropped a pin for us on Google Maps, and we got out and started setting up camp immediately because it was it was the middle of September and it was already 7:45 ish, going on 8 o'clock probably. So we knew it'd be getting dark soon. I did not set out recorders. I just was worried about getting it set up before dark. I didn't put any recorders out, which I'm kicking myself still to this day for that. But we had gotten the tent up for the most part and we're putting on the rain fly and stuff and over to the right there's lots of trees um, not real thick but there was lots of branches down shrubs you know undergrowth and stuff and then on further back it goes up a slight incline on further back is the tree line where it really gets thick and so in that area where there's a lot of undergrowth, we started hearing what sounded like moans to us. Um, kind of like low moans or low deep growls. But at that point, I remember thinking, I even asked Carrie, I'm like, are those moans? And you know, we, we don't acknowledge what we hear. We don't look out or point, you know. We just talk to each other and keep doing what we're doing. We want to act like we're campers, mm -hmm. you know, and just be nonchalant about everything and act like maybe we're not even hearing it. And But I did ask her, I said, are those moans? And she said, it sounds like it. We've never heard moans before that time. And so that was a little strange, you know. But then after a few minutes of hearing a few of those moans, it started to where the moans would turn into an animal sound. At one point, it would moan and then turn into a cow, which there were no cows out there. Uh, it would moan and turn into what sounded like a sick chicken. It moaned and turned into a whimpering dog. And then I do remember that it moaned and turned into a bear sound. And it sounded like a bear, 
Those others, you could tell something was a little off. The whimpering dog was pretty good, but there was no dog out there. But when it turned into a bear sound, I know that that area does have black bear. And so that was a little creepy and I didn't want to take any chances. And plus it was, it was a little scary. And so I told Carrie, I said, um, I don't like the thought that that could possibly be a bear. We didn't have bear spray. And I said, so why don't we get the recorders out? We had finished with the tent. I said, let's get the recorders out, leave them out and go into town, which was a 40 minute drive and see if we can get some bear spray. And I said, maybe by the time we get back, Henry will be here. And so we did that. I got the recorder out, left it out. It was 8.30, I think, when we left, because I always say what time it is on the recorder. We left, got back to camp, and set, uh, set up our chairs around the fire. And when we sat down around the fire, we had, I had a gun in my cup holder, and I had the recorder in my other hand. And I remember saying that it was, I think, 10.30 at this time. So Carrie and I are now sitting in front of the fire, facing that tree line, and our tent is over here to the left. Almost as soon as we sit down, we hear this big call. And it's coming from somewhere over in that tree line, but further on back. It wasn't right upon us, but it was loud, and it was awesome. And then, not long after that, we started hearing what sounded, to me, it sounded like a power saw, but it was coming from that tree line. And we know that there weren't any electricity out there, but just, it was baffling, because I'd never heard that before in the middle of the woods, what sounded like a power saw, but it was so loud. But when you would hear that sound, it's like this power saw, it went into a whoop. And it was a perfect whoop. But that was in front of us. And as soon as that ended, from behind us, kind of over our left shoulder, was an identical sound. I mean, it sounded like it could have been the same creature doing it. And I remember saying, this is so freaking awesome, or freaking unbelievable, or something like that. I was so amped up by this point, because never in our life had we had any of this stuff like this happen, not to this extremity, you know. And so it went on through the night while we were still sitting out there, that there were howls and calls and whoops and we could hear twig, twig breaking and snapping, you know, out in that wood line. Um, you know, we'd get up and move. We tried not to jump up and down because it was so awesome, but we tried to just stay calm and stoke the fire, add wood to the fire, wait on Henry. Uh, we were texting her 
my mine weren't going through but we were both texting her saying where are you this this is some awesome stuff happening here but just all sorts of sounds we were hearing and finally we decided to go to bed and because I had not set the recorders out like I normally do um, I had had them both I had two recorders at that time I had them both with me and I was using my best recorder while I was sitting there in recording all this but I told Carrie I said I'm not going out in those woods to hang these recorders up so I just set one on each end of our tent there were two trees that made like a V shape so I set my recorder in the center of those trees and on the right hand side there was a mound of grass like a almost like mondo grass I laid the other recorder up on that and so they were both just sitting there and since it was the middle of September you know there were tons of crickets and the crickets were pretty loud uh, off and on most of the night and so you could hear that but we went in started getting ready for bed and while I was messing with my cot getting it all ready I heard what sounded like a human cough and I just looked at Carrie and I said Henry's here I thought it was Henry that she had finally gotten there and so I unzip my window, which was right there over my cot, and I look out. I can see my campfire, and it was lit up enough, but there was no Henry. And Henry's vehicle wasn't there, nothing. So I zip up my window again, and I look at Carrie, and I step back a little bit because I said, that wasn't Henry. I, and, and then there was another cough. That one was right in front of me, but to the right, as I had just told her that wasn't Henry, within just a few seconds there was another cough but this time it was more to the left same exact cough though it was like a <laughs> I don't know why I put my hand up there but like you know when you cough <laughs> two syllables and so I said did you hear that did you hear that that cough and she shook her head no and I, I went it's right over here and of course I'm not talking real loud because now I'm wondering who was that because it sounded like a human cough to me and so I step over towards the center. We still had the little security, not security, but night light that hangs in the center of the tent. It was a real dim light. We still had that on. And I stepped to the middle of the tent because now I'm getting a little unnerved because I'm thinking that was a human sounding cough. And I'm thinking, is this a redneck bubba that's come up, you know? But there had been no car sounds. You know, right. and um, so I, I told Carrie, I was fixing to tell her, you know, Carrie, that was a human sounding cough. And about that time, it coughs again, but now it's more towards the back corner of our tent. And she heard that one. And you could, you could hear movement by this time. It had gotten closer to the tent and it coughed again. It worked its way originally, I mean, all the way around the tent coughed a total of eight times. <laughs> and by this time, I was really worried that it was humans out there. I, that's why I carry a gun. It's for humans and big hogs, big cats. And I, that just worries me. And so I was worried about that. So we're standing in the middle of the tent and uh, then we hear something like being thrown at the tent, which, okay, now we're back to Bigfoot activity, you know, in our minds, but we're confused because we've got what we think are human coughs so we sat down in the middle of the tent and we're talking and I'm asking her, I'm like, do you think it could be humans? And she said, well, if it is, they walked a long ways in. And so about that time, we hear something on the backhand side of the tent and it sounds like it's either dragging its fingers or a branch or something across the top of the tent. And this is a huge tent. We could stand up in it, and especially in the center part, but I can stand up in that tent it's a nice tent 
we've got something now dragging something across the top of the tent and I remember you know we were watching it and we turned this way and we're watching it go this way she had a little closet area that jutted out from the back and you know you could use it as a little storage closet for whatever but we put our potty in there you know and we had it had flaps on the front so our potty was sitting in that area and that potty had you know we had used it and whatever was dragging his fingers or whatever hesitated over that potty area and you could hear it just it wasn't making a lot of noise but you could tell that it was doing something to the tent and so we're looking up towards that area trying to see what we can see and at that same time something else another one is on the right hand front corner where my cot was and it just hits the hell out of that cot and we're both this way so when that happened I think we probably, you know, made a little, ah, like, right. and looked over there, and the whole side of that tent was just in a wave, you know, because it was just, it had hit it hard. And so now we know that there's two. Whatever this is, there's two of them, at least. And so I told Carrie, I said, I got to know if this is humans. Because we'd had all this Bigfoot activity, you know, beforehand with the, the whoops and the calls and growls and all that. But now all of a sudden we've got something that sounds like coughs. And those coughs each time were identical, identical. And so I said, let's get our key fobs. And you know how you can hit your key fob and it'll light up your headlights and honk the horn? I said, let's get our key fobs in one hand, put our guns in the other, because if this was humans, I wanted guns, because if it was humans, they were jacking with us. And I said, let's stand in that doorway, side by side, and wait until we hear some movement that sounds like it's from the front. And when we do, let's hit the key fobs and go out at the same time and see if we can catch it, whatever it is, in the headlights. So we stood there and waited, and finally heard something that sounded like it was in front of our tent, and we swung that door open and we came out of there like Charlie's Angels, you know, with the guns and the horn had gone off and there was absolutely nothing that we could see. Stayed out there just a few minutes, went back into the tent and uh, it was quiet, you know, for a good five, maybe 10 minutes after that, Carrie had laid back down. I had decided to lay back down. So I'm thinking, okay, lay there I'm still worked up because I don't know what that was that we've been hearing so it wasn't two minutes after I lay down my mind's racing I start hearing sounds again you could hear calls way off you know little whoops but you could hear twigs breaking movement right outside our tent again so I get up again I get in the middle Carrie's on her side on the tent and I asked her I said do you hear that and she said no I didn't hear that and she goes, this is my good ear. And I said, what? You have a bad ear? <laughs> this is something I kind of needed to know. Of course, I'm like, what? You have a bad ear? <laughs> but uh, I said, well, sit up. You know. So as soon as she starts to sit up, before she could even halfway get up, something pushes her cot from the outside. And that cot moves probably that far. We're sitting there. The activity starts back up again, pretty much like it had been beforehand. Uh, no more coughs, but there's tons of movement, twigs breaking. We can hear calls every so often way out in the front. And I'm telling her, you know, I'm like, I still, I still want to know if this was humans that's doing this, you know, that's doing all of these, these coughs and that's messing with our tent. So we decide to go out a second time the same way but this time we're going to start the vehicle because then the main lights come on and they stay on and we do it again we wait until we hear something and then we barrel out that door the same way the lights are on nothing there and so we we go back in the tent wait calms down lay down this time she rolls over on her left hand side and uh I'm still in the middle. I was sitting, there was a big uh, root that came up through the middle 
And so I was trying to find a comfortable place because I didn't decide I'm just going to sit here all night. Because I mean, by this time, it was probably 2 in the morning. And um, she had rolled over, but she was hearing so much outside that she rolled back over towards me. And she's pointing to her ear, you know, saying, I'm hearing stuff, basically. And I nodded. And um, the whoops and howls and different sounds that we're hearing, she ended up getting in the middle of the tent again with me. We're sitting there. And while we're talking, we got to the point where we weren't talking like this, but we were talking in a low voice because it didn't matter. There was still so much going on. They didn't care if we were talking. And while we're sitting there, I happened to look over to that right-hand corner where it had previously been hit, and it hits it again. And this time, I see what looked like a hand. Now, I couldn't make out like fingers, but it was the size of a big hand. It came in probably, what's that, probably about eight inches. Mm -hmm. And the X on my cot, you know, the legs, that's the area it, it, it had pushed in on. So it was probably about six inches, eight inches off the ground where it was hitting. So it was way down low. And it did the same way, did the whole side of the tent up and down in waves. We've been texting Henry by this point, where are you? You need to hurry up. We've got tons of stuff going on. Uh, there's at least two out there. We've got all this going on. We just had that tent hit the second time. Um, I, I laid down. I got my Pella laid down there on the ground. She got back up. We'd get back down, get back up, get back down. I just laid down. And by this point, it was, I think, 3 o'clock. So I get back up and I lay down on my cot. And um, I'm laying there just a few minutes, and then I start hearing, you know, those twigs breaking again and everything. And I, I looked at my phone just to see what time it was, because I couldn't believe how this was just continuous, you know, all night. And it was 3.20. And um, so I'm laying there, and I listened for another probably 20, 25, 30 minutes. And it was just so much movement, snapping, stuff going on outside. But then coming from a long ways off what seemed to me to be along that ridge line where the tree the tree lines were I mean um, was this voice and it was just gibberish you know I couldn't make out what it was saying but you could tell it was saying something and it was really short and it was just like blah 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 and then in a totally different voice coming from that same area was an answer real short too just blah 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 and just it was the strangest thing I'd ever heard you know it was literally gibberish to me but then closer in towards us in my head you know it was in between me the tent and where the two voices that it had just come from was this third deeper more uh, stern sounding gibberish and it was I envisioned it was standing there pointing his finger saying you get you get your butts back home and leave these women alone and uh, it was there was a pause in between whatever it was saying you know it was like blah 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 just within seconds of that third voice starting, I thought, oh my God, is Carrie awake? Because she was on her side facing the, you know, the outside part of the tent. So I had come up on one foot and stepped and just hit her, you know, just to make sure she was hearing this. And she rolled over and, and I do like that, you know, and, and she nods her head. So I'm, I'm like, thank God. Cause at first I'm like, am I dreaming this part that I just, <laughs> that I just heard? It was just crazy. And so she was hearing it too. And within just a couple, three seconds probably of that third voice stopping, you could hear wood snapping and then it was splintering and it just came crashing to the ground. And it was so loud and you could literally feel it you know in the tent when it hit the ground it was just unbelievable you know we we sat there and we talked and kind of 
went over some of the stuff that we had heard we were just it was amazing experience and uh, we you know finally laid back down in the bed she had stayed in the bed but I laid back down in the bed and I laid there just thinking about it all and finally just fell asleep I don't know what time it was I I got there late when after all, all this was going on and uh, it was 3:34 in the morning and when you drive in you have to go past where we were camping and then turn back in so my headlights never hit their tent or anything but I I killed it and I was just had my window down I just wanted to listen for a while and up on the up on the ridge you could see the top of the ridge I saw something it looked like a leg going behind a tree and that was kind of cool and then all of a sudden a tree fell so I thought I'll just I'll just sit right here then see y'all in the morning but when I opened my eyes it was daylight and so I looked out the window and there was Henry finally she was out there and messing around her vehicle and I told Carrie I said that's Henry and we both just went out and um, I said where have you been you don't know what you've missed and then I was telling her what all had happened and I got to the part of right after that third gibberish how a tree had crashed and she said I did hear a tree crash and so we ended up going into town that next day three of us while Barbara came in at 10 o'clock that morning was setting up her tent me, Carrie, and uh, Henry went into town to get some splitters because we were really going to rig up the equipment. Because those that night, there was just sitting there on each side of the tent, you know, my two recorders. So we wanted to make sure we had everything set up right that second night. And uh, that evening, I made sure to put my recorders out at 7.45ish before it started getting dark. I zip-tied one off to the left behind my tent a good distance. And uh, it was probably six foot, seven foot up in the tree, however high I can reach up, zip tying it to a tree. Um, said what time it was and everything, then walked off a good 60, 75 feet away, um, more to the front of the tree, straight up from camp, and was zip tying my other recorder. And Henry and Barbara had been hanging out glow necklaces again in the ridge line but I didn't see them. But I heard, again, what sounded like a cough from that per the night before. And I thought it's just Barbara. Uh, I thought maybe she's just, you know, joking or whatever, or she just coughed. And I said on my recorder, you can hear it say, there's Miss Barbara. But she didn't say anything. And so I said, Barbara? And I'm still trying to get the thing rigged up and she didn't answer and so I said Barbara and I turn around and look towards camp and she steps out from behind the other side of the tent and she says what and I said did you just cough and she said no I said did any of y'all just cough and they all said no and so I say okay wait a minute and I hightail it into camp because I had just heard what I thought was a cough but Playing it back on my computer, it took a while because my computer was horrible and it just would quit working half the time. So it took a long time for me to listen to it and get it on the computer and snips of it and everything. But listening to that cough from the second night when I was hanging at recorders, it freaked me out because when it played back, it doesn't sound like a cough a two-syllable cough it literally you can hear it say in almost like a whisper something says hey Debbie and it breaks my name into two distinct syllables and when I heard that I got goosebumps You know, I'm sitting there on my couch listening to this, and that creeped me out. And it takes a lot to creep me out, but that creeped me out. I played it over and over and over listening to it, and it just clearly says, hey, Debbie. And I sent it to, you know, a bunch of all the girls, and I said, what do you hear here? And they all said, oh, my God, we hear, hey, Debbie. Sent it to, you know, Mark Newble, Larry Porch. 
uh, same thing. It just was so weird. But then that got me wondering, okay, I thought that was a two-syllable cough when I heard it. So the night before when I heard what I thought were eight two-syllable coughs, was it saying Debbie? I don't know now. This was in January. I think Debbie and them had had their all-nighter, I believe, in September of 17. I believe that's when it was, somewhere in that fall region. Well, this past January, January 19, um, we all had the opportunity to meet up, and that's where they decided we were going to all go. And I was excited, you know. I'd heard all about the all-nighter and couldn't wait to get out there and let's go camping. So we... Um, we set up our tents and everything, and it was cold. Oh my God, the wind was blowing. It was probably 30 degrees, and it was windy, really windy. And we were by a lake at that, a big lake, and the wind was blowing off that lake on top of all that. So you talk about, it was cold. But it was also, after even all that, it had started raining pretty heavy that night, and Barbara's Barbara, it's in front of her tent. She had her little canopy set up, and she also had another tarp. So me and Debbie were kind of sitting under the tarp, and she was sitting under the tent. And Debbie and me started hearing some moans right across from where Barbara's over her. She couldn't hear them because of the way she was angled, but me and Debbie was hearing them. And uh, me and Debbie always have a way of looking at each other, just giving each other the eye and a nod. Yeah, I heard it too, you know, that's what we're saying. And and I remember Debbie, because we don't think they can understand our language, she's saying that's the kind of moans I was hearing that night. There was some lights behind the tent where Barbara was, they had strung some little Christmas lights. And they had gone out. We thought maybe something had actually possibly turned those lights out, but we found found out later on they were battery operated on a timer. While we were standing back there behind that tent, we heard what we call the truck motor growls. Was, you know, it sounded like a, a truck engine shifting gears and then shift back up, shifting gears. But it's like the truck was just sitting there, <laughs> wasn't going nowhere. And she said, oh my God, Sandy, that's what I heard last time with Carrie back back there, back in September of 17. I'm like, wow. She says, you hear it, don't you? I said, oh, yeah, I, I definitely hear it. Absolutely. Well, it probably did it, I'm saying, about four times or, or so. And we finally just turned around and went back and set up under the tarps. It had started raining somewhat again and probably set up till about 12. 30-ish, maybe 1 o'clock, and we all decided to call it a night. And um, because Debbie had the uneasy feeling that she had that one night with Carrie, she decided that she was going to sleep in the, the tent with me and Barbara that night. And Barbara was on one end of the tent, I was on the other. Well, I turned over and was facing the actual tent. Um, and I did not know it at the time, but Debbie had turned in the same direction that I had turned in, so she was facing that tent wall too. Well, the, the little dim little Christmas lights um, were flickering in the back a ways a little bit, but they let off just enough light where you could see something out there if it was to walk by you. And I'd probably been laying there five, 10 minutes, and sure enough, an upright figure walked right by my side of the tent and um, I was like oh God. you know so what'd you see I seen I'm gonna say from what I could tell it was at least five or six foot tall pop possibly but I mean the tent end so if the tent had been taller it could have been taller I don't really know but that's what I could tell it looked like it was possibly five or six foot tall and I immediately rolled over and looked over at, at Debbie and she was looking at me and I'm not, I can't remember if it was her that lived it or if it was me, but one of us said, did you see that? And we both nodded in agreement. We had both seen the exact same thing. Well, as soon as I did 
that and we come to the understanding we had both seen it. I had it like I said it had been raining so we had propped up a chair up next to that side of the tent that I was on and as I was looking at Debbie and we had had made confirmation that we'd both seen something walk by that tent it actually bumped into the chair and it went on past the chair obviously and and um, we were just kind of laying there you know amazed that we were had seen something and now hearing something and whatever it was had squatted down on that side of the tent right in the perfect spot where you couldn't see it well Barbara had those plastic containers like you put stuff in like from Walmart one over there and one on the other side well it was interested in the one on this side it sounded just like it was trying to grab that tub and pull it it sounded like plastic being drug on rocks but it couldn't quite get it to how it wanted to at the angle and then you'd hear it like pop pop let go it would try again scrap scrape 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 pop pop and it, would, it did it several times well, me and Debbie both at that point had gotten on our stomachs and we had pressed our nose up against the tent wall trying to look through the actual tent wall and um, we couldn't see anything. And Debbie kind of looked at me and nodded and she did her little roll, we call it Mission Impossible. She kind of rolled across the tent and walked over, or scooted over to Barbara and kind of went up like a little squirrel or something, you know, but Barbara had her whole body covered and I, neither one of us seen what direction her head was in. So Debbie had to guess and uncover one part of her just to see if Barbara had heard it too. And she uncovered Barbara's head and I was looking over there and Barbara was not in agreement. She was hearing the same thing that Debbie and I was. Well, that brave little thing <laughs> we're pretty sure it was a Sasquatch, but I mean, we never actually laid eyes on it. Um, it just, it just was so interested in that, that tub. It just kept pulling it, scraping it. It just couldn't quite get a grip. And it, it if it had went out where we could see it, it could have snatched that thing away easy. But it was having to reach around something to try to get a hold of it, and it wasn't able to grab it just right. And had that been a, a raccoon or or something like that or even a bear they don't give a rip they'll stand there and look at you while they're trying to do stuff this was trying to stay hid and it was low it was trying to stay hid well Barbara and Debbie had even gotten up at some point and unzipped the front of her tent area through the door trying to even look out and it was still kept itself very hid from us it was staying in that one corner in that blind spot where we could not see it and it would it, it kept doing it and kept messing with the tub and uh, if you know my sister she can be very blunt even with Sasquatch possibly she got sick of it messing with that tub and she said get the hell out of here and I mean she said it very forcefully and me and Debbie just kind of looked at each other in surprise like oh my god are we this thing gonna get pissed at us what's it gonna do now you know and it actually stopped it listened to, to Barbara for a minute, but that was shortly. Uh, ten minutes later, it was right at it again, still trying to get in that tub. Um, and Barbara had said she had even heard, after that fact, she had heard it trying to mess in the back of her truck. She had wood and a tarp over it, and she could hear the tarp being messed with. And I, I, I don't know. I guess it was trying to hunt something, food or something, but... Yeah, it it stayed busy off and on up until I'm gonna say two thirty, three o'clock in the morning. And then it finally got bored and let us get some sleep. <laughs> I saw one running. I couldn't see its face, but I saw one running. Not how far away. It was probably um I had pulled up to park at a trailhead about twelve thirty at night. We were gonna go on a night hike, just two of us. And as I was parking, my lights went this way. There was a creek bed down there. I, I didn't know it was there at the time because it was dark. And it was just on the other side of the creek bed when it was running. And I would say probably 50 feet at the most. Close. Yeah. 
it, I could I could see it really good it was just side you know running from left to right my headlights as I was pulling in hit it and they were going from right to left and so my headlights hit it it was running this way I I was like I just saw something I'm putting it in reverse to try to back my car up to angle it because it was running that way and I wanted to try to follow it with my lights because my lights is what lit it up and I didn't know it at the time I, I didn't know where it went it was gone but it had obviously ran down into that creek bed that I didn't know was there and just disappeared so I it I said when I saw it I said it's whitish but uh, it also had dirt mud something mm -hmm. right here on its back shoulder looked dirty and its hair when it was running and it was running fast its hair looked to be about that long blowing you know back behind its head but it looked whitish to me. And when I told some friends the next morning where, that we'd been camping with further on down, uh, away from there, they said that, that that area is known to have a gray Bigfoot that's been seen quite a bunch, wow. quite a lot. So maybe it was gray and my headlights so right. bright made it look white. But I did find a footprint when I went back the next morning to the area. It rained, I mean, come a flood all night long after that. So the creek bed was flowing. I couldn't find any tracks down in there, but I went back to the left, which was the direction it came from, and I went up into the woods a bit and found a print. It was 15 and a half inches long and five and a half inches wide. That's a good one. It was a good one. It was a good one. It's a big foot. I went on Facebook and made a private page and it was called, um, I was in a Bigfoot movie that flopped. And then we started going out more and more, and then all of a sudden, I just, I'm a Stevie Nicks fan, and I just, I just named it Sisters of the Moon, and here we go. If you had a, a motto for Sisters of the Moon, what, what would it be? Um, I would say, um, adv we're, we're just adventurous, you know, um, we really are serious about what we do, but we just really, I don't, I guess to find the truth, that would be our motto. We really want to find and really want to know, is it really, you know, is there something out there, you know, because we don't think we're crazy. We know what we've seen and we're, we're very factual, you know, we're not like, you know, like these people that post pictures and they have to put circles on everything, like, don't you see it? And we're like, no, we pretty much try, <laughs> we don't see it. But we try to truly look at things and, and look at it from, I always try to look at it from a scientific, like, okay, you know, if we find a footprint, okay, let's measure it with ours. I mean, we try to really investigate things because we really do want to find the truth. And we have such a camaraderie, you know, I don't know if I could say one saying, I just say that we really, we just mesh, you know, and we all just complement each other. And so, we all are not scared, you know, of course we have, we get scared at some things, but we're really pretty adventurous for women. And our motto is, we're females, we're not threatening. We set out funny things, interesting things, you know, we set out the glow sticks, the mirrors, the chimes, play the music. We want them to be interested in us, you know, we want them to come to us. We don't really have to go that much out to them because when we have our activity, they're coming to see what we're doing. And that's what we kind of, that's sort of a little bit of an edge, I guess, that we think we have because we're just females, you know, acting like we're camping and they're interested in that. <laughs> well, you're obviously a cohesive group. We are. We've, we've noticed that. One word to describe your role in this, or <laughs> your, your part. Who are you? Who am to, I? Who are you to the hmm. sisters of the moon? Well, nurse I guess the nurse the scientific person that wants to know the scientific you know the facts about it you know that's what I dig into because I'm having a background of being a nurse you know and and I'm always interested in like when we found those deer I'm like look at the different stages of decay you know and look at the fact that the neck the deer is all the skeleton is all together but the neck is broke the femurs broke you know I just like to look at it from kind of a, a little more of a I guess, scientific background. You've all got your own style and your own little personality. If, if Sisters of the Moon were a bunch of characters, which one would you be? 
What, what's your what's your niche in the sisters? What in my character? I would just kind of be like the mama hen, I guess. The mama hen. The mama hen. I look out after my girls the best I can. One word describe the cohesive sisters of the moon. One word. One word. Love. We love each other. And we love what we do. We love looking for Bigfoot and we love looking for Bigfoot together. What would you say would be your your role in the group? I mean, if you had one, what would it be? Who would you be to the group? Um, I, I say that I'm the executive director of appointing executive directors. <laughs> that way I don't have to do much. One word that describes the sisters to you. I have to say ballsy. Cause they'll they'll go anywhere you want to go they, they don't care you know they'll go in there with you and that's cool because we've gone through some raunchy raunchy places with bungee and we've done all right i'd have to say it would, i'm sorry i can't think of another word but we got up here they just sit a little higher i guess I if anybody if everyone had their own character which one would yours be to the sisters I would say I'd be a protector. A protector? Yeah, I'd have their back. I'm not going to be one to sit around and do a whole lot of chit-chatting, but I'm very observant. And I think I'd be one to spot something coming up the, the back pretty quickly. And if I seen them in harm's way, I'd be the one trying to, to get them gone first. Now, you know what? The situation could actually take place for real, and I'd not be trying to knock them out of the way to get in front of them, but I really think that I've always been that kind of way. I've always been a, a person that tries to protect other people. Um, even in my jobs I've worked, I always, somebody was being done wrong or mistreated, I was always that type of person to stand up for them. So that's what I would be, I think. That's okay. what I would want to be anyway. Now, one word to describe the group. Trust. We trust every. We trust each other's judge, judgments. We trust each other. What comes out of our mouths, the truth. Um, trust. That's a very valuable thing to have in a group. Do you have a motto? A saying? Oh, well, we have a logo that's on our shirts. Okay. You know, a little what motto: "Squatting Squatchers with a pair of knockers." Okay. <laughs> One word that describes the group. Sisters. We are we are united in so many ways. Um, we we feel like we are sisters. We trust each other, you know, like sisters should. At least I know some don't, but we do. We we trust each other. We love each other. We have each other's backs. We respect each other. We're of the same mindset in a lot of ways, but especially when it comes to Bigfoot. Um, we know that when one says something. It happened, and that it's the truth. Um, we love what we do when we get out in the woods together, when we're camping together. It's, it's perfect. Well said, ladies. Well, what a great trip to East Texas. Sisters of the Moon, I mean, what can you say about these ladies? I mean, you, you guys just watched it. Well, what an incredible group. Awesome. And it, it was pretty, it wasn't a long trip, but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily short. You know, we kind of met in the middle. I was in West Texas. Linda was at home in Mississippi, and we kind of met in the middle there at the, uh, at the conference. And a lot of people there. Oh my gosh, we met so many people. Yeah, it was really good. We, uh, not just the researchers, but people that had came up to the convention from a long way off, and then of course on our way out, Miss Kim. That was probably the yeah. one that stuck out. She had seen me twice because I saw her, and she didn't say anything. I don't think she recognized me, but she recognized Linda. Because as soon as she saw Linda, she went, <gasps> "Linda, Carrie." Which I, I was shocked about because I'm not on here quite as much really? as Carrie is, but I mean it was great meeting so many. Yeah, it was. Yeah, Phil, uh, reverse thrust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for, for coming down and meeting us. 
uh, Miss Nidra and Larry Smith. Just they drove like ten hours to come down there to the conference. It was uh, it was something. Uh, you know, I was really more excited about meeting more researchers for us to do shows with. And I was actually, I was kind of surprised at how many people had already, you know, seen our stuff and, and kind of knew who we were. Um, a lot of the, the bigger researchers, the only one that didn't know who we were was, was Cliff uh, Barackman. And well, he said he didn't. But, uh, but, you know, I talked to him for probably 20, 30 minutes. And, uh, but, you know, Lyle Blackburn, Ken Garrard, um, this time, Michael May was there with, with Texas Bigfoot, so I mean... Yeah, the Texas Bigfoot Rangers. Rangers, yeah. Yeah, Mary Bowen and uh, and Michael. A lot of people. Gosh, it was too many to remember, because I mean... Texas Cat. There was so many. And Wayne Foster. Yeah, I mean, just... It was, it was great. It was a nice it was convention. It really oh, was. I got, uh, I got Keith Crabtree's autograph. Yeah, the... Legend of Bayou Creek. Uh -huh. That was kind of cool. Yep, pictures in there. I gotta frame it for you. Yeah, he was kind of, he was the only one I was really starstruck by, I guess, was him, seeing him sitting there. And he sort of sat in the corner. He didn't really, he did. yeah, he didn't get out there with it. Everybody sort of came to him. So, right. <laughs> it was nice. It was really nice. And then, get, of course, getting out in the woods with the girls was All right. my favorite. I don't think we're going to be doing a whole lot of Bigfoot conferences. Um, we may do more. I don't know. I think it was just it would just happen to be filming with them while they were doing the conference, and it just kind of all worked out. Um, I don't think we're we're conference goers. We don't really have the time between work and then shooting the films, yeah, and you know we don't have a lot of time. But it was nice to meet everybody though. Yeah, it was. But yeah, I had a great time. Uh, I had some good drone footage um, that uh, didn't record. I got 27 seconds of drone footage, but uh, I, I do have some uh, for the for the outro. That's the same relative area, so um, you'll get to see that anyway. And a lot of promos. Yes. We got a lot of good promos from people. So and some bloopers. You guys yeah. are uh, you guys are in for uh, some bloopers in this one. I know we we didn't put any in the last one, and but we we had a couple that we probably could have put in, but I don't know, I think I was I was in a hurry to get it done and get it out and, well, and we get had back a, to work. It was a lot of film in this time. I mean, between the convention, the wood scenes, the, I mean, it was just a, a little lot. over nine. Yeah, I had nine hours and 13 minutes of raw footage that I cut down into this two hour and whatever this is. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, had a good time. The sisters are great. And we're trying to talk them into getting a YouTube channel uh, because they have a lot of evidence, you know, just the stuff that they sent us that went along with the stories they told is not all they have. They've got a ton of stuff. And, uh, yeah. Well, we, just, gotta, we gotta get them to, to do something on YouTube. You gotta do something on YouTube, yeah. ladies. Well, and just sitting around them like at the campfire, I love listening to their stories. Now, Henry, at first, she's not, wasn't very open and talkative, and then she started talking, but she has got a lot of good stories, too. Yeah. And Debbie, too. I mean, they just... The girls sort of mesh. They, they're all different in their own ways, but they just, they mesh together. They make the group. And, and sisterhood is sisters of the moon is a good name for them because that's even though there's two sisters in it, Sandy and Barbara are sisters. They all come together as sisters, and it's just. Our yeah. song Hunter said they sound like a coven <laughs> of witches, sisters of the moon. <laughs> he loves the he loves the name because he's into all that. So. <laughs> And you got to be. Uh, I am honorary sister of the moon. I and he didn't get one. He whined about it, y'all. I did not. He did too. He finally whined enough. He got a shirt. <laughs> I said I can identify as a sister of the moon. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> yeah, holiday season. We're not really sure uh, what's coming up next. I was gonna go down to Florida and and do uh, our episode thirteen as kind of a pre-episode to the um, to the expedition, but I'm not gonna have time. You know, I thought I was gonna be home for two weeks, but I'm only gonna be home for a week. Uh, you know, new job, and so, not gonna have time to do that, and I might be home for a few days after Christmas, I don't know. So, look for episode 13, beginning of the year, uh, sometime in January, and I'll, uh, I'll decide where we're gonna go, and 
who we're going to do that with. Well, and the holidays are meant for family time anyway, so you right. know, enjoy your time with your family and your children because, you, you know, holidays only come around once a year, so. Yes. Well, that it? I'm sure you better stop it because I can think of other stuff, so. <laughs> well, stick around. We got some good promos and, of course, some good bloopers. But for Debbie, Patty, Sandy, Henry, and Barbara, my beautiful wife, Linda, I'm Carrie Arnold. Hope to see you on the next Bigfoot Odyssey. Good night, y'all. Hey y'all, this is Texas Cat and Khaki Lackey. Don't forget to watch Bigfoot Odyssey and like and subscribe. Like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Awesome deal. Thank you all for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. It's the greatest true story you'll ever see. Thanks for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Please like, share, and subscribe. It's um, it's a great channel with some great content and fascinating stuff. You'll love it. We love it. Hi, this is Ken Gerhard, cryptozoologist, and I just want to remind you to watch Bigfoot Odyssey. Like, watch, subscribe. Hey, everybody. If you want to see something odd, then check out Bigfoot Odyssey. Huh? Thanks for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hey, this is Tex with Trinity Paracrypt Research. Y'all be sure and give Carrie and Linda a thumbs up, subscribe, and make your comments respectful because Linda will set you straight. Y'all have a good one. Tex out. Hey, this is Lyle Blackburn. Thanks for watching Bigfoot Odyssey on YouTube. This is Nick Redfern. You're watching Bigfoot Odyssey on YouTube. This is Mark Newble. And I'm Larry Porch from Sawdust Beast. Thanks for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Get you a fresh dip. And make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit that bell for the notifications. And buckle up. Ouch. So I knew it wouldn't be on. No. <laughs> Boom. Hey, Tex here with uh, Trinity Paracryptic Research. You want to do that again? Do what? You want to do that again? Since you said uh, with uh, like you didn't remember. I <laughs> uh, forgot my show, but. This is what I am. <laughs> I'll say thanks for watching Big Photography. <laughs> and then you say the rest, remember it? Uh, All right. Yeah. Say anything I want. Yeah. Hey, thanks for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Don't like forget. No. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> like and subscribe. Get where I need. To... Let me get where I need to be. Come on. Okay. Did it move or did I move? You got. You moved. We gotta get in the middle here. Let me put this up. Hopefully, I won't need it again. You tell me when you're where you're gonna be. So I'll put it around to you. I'm here. You gotta come in. So you gotta come in the middle. Am I in the middle? Are we close enough? I'm close. You mean stand up more? Yeah, honey, you stand up, do it. Yeah, I'm fine with you doing whatever you want. I just want to hold you. I'm going to do this. <laughs> I just fixed my hair now. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, that was a good one. This is. It ain't the cigarettes. You ready? On this episode of Bigfoot Odyssey, we're in East Texas with Sisters of the Moon. This group of ladies. Sorry. Come on. I got it. <laughs> all right, all right. On this episode of Bigfoot Odyssey, we're in East Texas with Sisters of the Moon. This group of ladies lay the course of Bigfoot research together. Though individual experiences helped influence their individual. Those eyes interest. Are <laughs> individual interest. <laughs> the eyes are getting you ready to do this again? I slid a sheet of sheet, I slid upon a slid a sheet, I well, slid Well, don't okay, say that. <clears throat> Alright, we're gonna do this one more time. I'm ready.
All right, let's do this. On this episode of Bigfoot Odyssey, we're in East Texas with Sisters of the Moon. This group of ladies, Linda. I saw that dude coming. Come on. <laughs> You're laughing. Quit laughing. Okay. Let's go. On this episode of Bigfoot Odyssey, we're in East Texas with Sisters of the Moon. This group of ladies laid the course of Bigfoot research together. Though their individual experiences helped influence their interest in the subject. This could take a while. This group of ladies laid the course of Bigfoot research together. Shut up. I'm ready. I just woke up. I don't want to hear it. That's no excuse. You done messed up ten times. It is a, it is an excuse. Come on. Though their individual experiences helped influence their <clears throat> with each member lending their own style and proficiency to the aggregate. A high standard. <laughs> Saw that one. something in my eye. Yeah. With each member lending their own style and proficiency to the aggregate. With a st mm. With an open mind. My mind is open. <laughs> it just it opened so much my brain fell off. <laughs> <No. laughs> you have had some brain farts today, I promise you man. <laughs> Ready to do this for a time? With an open mind. <laughs> Come on now. All right, let's do this. Come on now. Be serious. <clears throat> got it. We got some bloopers now. No, we don't. Yes, we do. Because you're going to behave yourself. This is going in bloopers. Oh, hell. No, it ain't. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Quit arguing with your wife. Let's do it. Though their individual experiences helped influence their that truck came by and he was gonna do it too. <clears throat> My throat's dry. Shut your mouth. Alright, here we go. On this episode of Hang On. On this episode of Hang On. What are you scratching? We're gonna have a channel called Hang On. You need to stop. Hang on. Let's go. Are you three? Oh. No, I wanna keep you sometimes. With an open mind, a skeptical eye, and a high standard for evidence. I said with. Mm-hmm. I didn't mean to. So sorry. <clears throat> An open mind, a skeptical eye, and a high standard for evidence put Sisters of the Moon. Why can't I say sisters? I don't know. Sisters? Sisters. <laughs> Sounds like you want to say sitters. Sitters of the Moon. Well, stop that. It's usually me that screws up. It's you this time. On this episode, I'll do it. I'll tell you what. I'll do this. Ladies, ladies. You need ladies, to ladies. stop or I'm going to let the girls get a hold of you. Now let's do this. Ladies, ladies, ladies. Of course, I'll be able to race those together. <laughs> I haven't had nothing to eat since early this morning. I'm getting hungry now. Come on. Linda puts a corn cob in her butt before we go anywhere. I'm going to put something in yours in about two seconds <laughs> if you don't get this done. All right. Oh, let's see. There's a bug now. I'm scared. That was a one of them yellow <clears throat> ready? That's a deer fly. Oh, well they still bite too. It's a fly deer. Come on. Is that good enough? Well there's things there in the night Make a grown man die from fright So many things, it's all so clear Something just ain't right 
When it's too hard to ignore You gotta open up that door And take some time to try and find The truth that lies in store In your big foot odyssey In your big foot odyssey Out there waiting, and it's up to you to see.